Your colleagues, welcome to our session today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, given your location. Our session today is made possible given the funding support that we get from the Gates Foundation to ASLM and partners. My name is Francis Ochen, a project manager at ASLM, and delighted to be your moderator today. Our housekeeping rules continue to hold and will run for one hour and we'll take one shared presentation and get into the questions and answers. Kindly join our discussions through the chat as your only way to, to participate in this discussion. We do have language interpretation services and please keep to either English, French or Portuguese depending on your language of choice. Our session slides and recording will be made available to you through our online uh, libraries and other social media platforms. Today, we focus on really setting up and running a sustainable national equipment maintenance and calibration center, uh, mm -hmm. focusing on the journey and experience from Uganda. As we are all aware, lab equipment really form part of a significant portfolio of our investment in lab services besides the infrastructure and human resource. And their proper selection, acquisition, and management should really be prioritized, not only because of their monetary value, but also given the fact that well-maintained and calibrated equipment are uh, really precursors in the production of valid and reliable results. Africa CDC really recommends that lab directorates and ministries of health should establish a national bioengineering calibration and maintenance facilities to service, maintain, and calibrate instruments within the laboratory network. And so moving away from individual labs to the entire laboratory network. And in this session, we share the journey by the Uganda Ministry of Health through the National Health Laboratory and Diagnostic Services in conceptualizing, setting up and running a national equipment maintenance and calibration center that currently supports a broad equipment maintenance and calibration scope for both the public and private sector. And to take us through this, we have three presenters. Our first presenter is going to be Dr. Susan Nabada, who is the executive director for the Uganda National Health Laboratory and Diagnostic Services. Uh, the other presenter will then be Mr. Abdul Mutaka, and Abdul is the head of engineering and technical, and also the technical manager for the National Equipment Calibration Center with the Uganda National Health Laboratory and Diagnostic Services. And the last but not least presenter is uh, Ms. Rosa Chom, and Ross is a biomedical engineer and quality manager with the National Equipment Calibration uh, Center. Uh, also still with the Uganda National Health Laboratory and Diagnostic Services of the Ministry of Health, Uganda. And so let me hand it over to the team doing the presentation, and then we'll come at the end with questions and answers. And please keep your questions and answers coming through the chat when we start. Uh, Abdul, let me hand it over to you, and then you move it on from there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Francis. Thank you so much, Francis, for giving us this opportunity as Uganda to share our experience of how to set up and run a sustainable national equipment maintenance and calibration center. You've clearly stated it, the role of calibrating and maintaining equipment in the quality of lab services. Um, Dr. Susan Novada, the laboratory director of the Directorate of Laboratory Services in Uganda. And we are glad to present our experience basing on the Maputo Declaration of 2008 that asked countries to harmonize all automated equipment at different levels of care. And in that line, Uganda took it up and, and embraced it and we developed guidelines and 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 and, and, and meant guidance on maintenance and management of service contracts for equipment at all different levels in line with partners 
with support from partners and and different um uh, implementing partners to, that supported us to do this so we are here to share our journey of where we started when we embraced this declaration to where we are where we are now both a national resource but also a resource that is supporting the region the region at large so kindly we are open to all your questions and 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 clarifications and guidance that you want to be given and with that introduction i hand over to our biomedical team lead at the, at, the, at the directorate, who is the technical manager for the National Equipment Calibration Center to take us through our journey. Over to you, Engineer Mutaka. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Susan, for the uh, introduction. Thank you so much, uh, um, the SLM team, uh, for the opportunity uh, given to us uh, to share with you our journey uh, of establish, establishing uh, an equipment calibration laboratory that is functional. Like, um, like I was in, uh, in, uh, introduced, my name is Mutaka Abdul. Um, I head engineering, like Dr. Susan has introduced me, and uh, I'm also the technical manager for the National Equipment Calibration Lab based in Kampala. So the the lab was established to answer the the call raised by uh, 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 at the Maputo Declaration that time in two zero eight to have um, lab, uh, countries uh, sustain sustain themselves uh, in, in the line of equipment uh, management, and uh, this entailed uh, automated uh, uh, harmonizing automated equipment, and then management of uh, maintenance contracts. And then uh, you know uh, managing auxiliary equipment uh, uh, internationally, and uh, this is where we picked it up. So uh, as in, in Uganda, like Dr. Susan said, we harmonized all our automated equipment, and uh, we went ahead and uh, designed means of managing uh, maintenance contracts for both automated and non-automated equipment. Uh, those uh, that are automated, that are under different uh, procurement uh, mechanisms, we, we had them and uh, they're being managed by different um, uh, organizations and then uh, and, and suppliers. And then the non-automated equipment is entirely managed by the in-country team. So when we took it up, we, we, we developed uh, policies to guide the decisions that were made we developed guidelines and then we developed strategies that can that we are supposed to be using to uh, you know uh, guide us in the, in the in the journey and as such i've uh, obtained significant uh, transformation in the laboratory and this has resulted into over 70 laboratories attaining international accreditation in different fields we had a number of them in 15189 accreditation a number of them in for as 15043 and our own that is actually uh, created in line uh, in uh, 17025. Next slide. So um, the approach that we, we, we took as a country um, is uh, one, we began with the recruitment of biomedical engineers and these were recruited and distributed to regional equipment maintenance workshops. Uganda is divided into um, 16 regions, each region, or, uh, region with a, a functional equipment maintenance workshop. And these workshops therefore were uh, equipped with an additional skill. And this skill was that by a medical engineer that was actually um, um, recruited with support from PEPFA. Uh, through partners, and um, they, 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 we recruited and distributed them in different uh, workshops. So uh, after their recruitment, they, together with the lab and facilities where they're serving, carried out a needs assessment uh, to inform decision, to inform the ministry where the gaps are in the areas of equipment management and equipment maintenance holistically. And after that assessment, then these engineers were equipped after knowing which areas they're supposed to be handling, which type of equipment they're supposed to be managing and how big they are. Then through support from uh, PEPFA, through, uh, we, uh, we, uh, from other partners, 
we equipped them with the necessary tools to enable them carry out uh, the requirements that they identified during the needs assessment that were carried out. And that also informed uh, the, 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 the management of the ministry on the trainings that these guys required to be able to maintain laboratory equipment in their own regions. So uh, Minister of Health uh, developed a training curriculum and uh, training materials that were discussed comprehensively and uh, with all with all stak different stakeholders uh, involved uh, to answer the needs. After the curriculum was developed, then we offered the targeted trainings to address the needs that came out from the needs assessment that we carried out from these facilities. So uh, it was very clear that we uh, uh, the regional workshops are lacking in management of uh, you know centrifuges, management of pets and other things. But in addition, we also found out that some of these workshops had other engineers that were not necessarily biomedical engineers. So then this informed us that we needed to have a tailored curriculum that was bridging an electrical or mechanical engineer to perform uh, equipment that are working on a human being. And therefore we took them to issues like anatomy and physiology, health technological management and others to bridge that gap in order for us to train somebody who knows how the machine relates to the equipment that is working on. And once that one was developed, then we also developed maintenance guidelines to guide them on who does what, who uh, maintains what, you know, who procures what, and how do we use for procurement? We have different types of procurement in Uganda. We have outright purchases for non-automated equipment. We have um, reagent rental for non-automated. And so whose role is it to manage in this area? So that was done and well uh, defined by the maintenance guidelines. And then after doing that, there came an issue of uh, quality of the equipment that is being maintained by the regional workshops. So then the ministry decided, no, we shall have also to put a center that will ensure that the quality of the equipment that is being maintained is actually checked. And that's why we had to establish uh, a, an equipment calibration laboratory. Next slide. So um, on the screen, we are looking at um, a copy of the equipment maintenance guideline that was developed. And this was developed and uh, put onto the shelf of the uh, facilities uh, in 2018. And it has pro uh, guidelines, guides on how equipment is procured, um, the different types of procurement for different types of equipment. We have those that are reagent rental, those that are outright purchase, those that are on placement. So these guidelines guide all the stakeholders in the, in the area of uh, equipment management on how to procure equipment. Who is supposed to install and commission? The guidelines clearly stipulate that area and is well made, uh, uh, mentioned in that guideline. Who does the operation and maintenance? This is uh, number three that called for us to equip the regional workshops, you know, because they have the mandate of maintaining uh, non-automated laboratory equipment. It was taken on at that level as their mandate and it's well stipulated and, uh, uh, you know, clearly stipulated how they are supposed to be doing this. The rest of uh, the, the, the other guideline that is in these guidelines is the decommissioning. We all know that decommissioning is a very, very big challenge in, in facilities. So these guidelines guide on how we decommission the laboratory equipment. It also guides us on how we do the disposal of lab equipment once the equipment has ended its life cycle. Next slide. So um, coming to the National Equipment Calibration Laboratory, the quest for uh, management, proper management of uh, equipment calibration and maintenance uh, drove us towards that direction. So in 2017, we um, established the, the National Equipment Calibration Laboratory, and it was ad uh, to address the skyrocketing uh, costs related to equipment maintenance. 
Because, I mean, every service provider was coming with his own price. Remember, this is a free market economy. You could price whatever you wanted to price. And in, most of them knew that they do, we don't have any alternative. So this drove us to establishment of that. We, uh, the, the, there was greater need for calibration of equipment as labs were moving towards accreditation. Slamta was calling, about, was calling for it. T99 was calling for calibration and maintenance. So this drove us into that area. We are also giving uh, a lot of money to service providers to manage uh, by safety cabinet certification. So uh, that defined the, the, the direction which we really wanted to do. And also to ensure that we train, reduce, re uh, we train personnel to reduce reliance eh, on outsourced service providers. Mm -hmm. And we ably did this. And uh, it's uh, the reason actually we're here. So um, that center that was established in 2017 was tasked with four major activities. The first one was to have a calibration, a functional calibration laboratory, and this is in place. The second one was to address issues of bisafety cabinet certification. This was also established and it's functional. The third one was to have a reference laboratory for equipment management, sorry, for equipment maintenance. So we established a workshop the uh, center to with the role of managing or uh, repair and maintenance of laboratory equipment together with the regional workshop that I mentioned uh, earlier on in my first slide in the regions. And then the fourth one is to carry out capacity building uh, in the in-service engineers, but also the users of laboratory equipment. Because it was found out from the studies that we were carried out that most of the equipment breaks down because of uh, challenges related to users. So how did we do it? We had a process, like I mentioned. So the process we did, and that we're supposed to be doing, Fatoria is supposed to be doing it, um, is first of all to carry out a baseline assessment to ascertain the level at which your facilities are. So for us, this baseline assessment informed us a lot on where we were as a country, uh, as uh, I mean, in line with uh, the where we want to be. And this is something that we had to do. Then um, uh, we looked at, you have to look at infrastructure improvement. If I told you have identified the place where you want to put your lab, look at areas and infrastructure, can it accommodate equipment? How is it in terms of uh, 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 environmental conditions? How is it in terms of vibration? Is this place vibration free? Is it a place with no dust? It has to be with minimum amount of, of dust because some of the, the, the processes require very little dust and all these other things. So we do uh, infra infrastructure improvement, equipment procurement then follows based on what you have identified as your infrastructure. You can never procure equipment without actually having where you're going to place this kind of equipment and what conditions, under which conditions this, this equipment is going to operate from. If it's about a bed calibrator, we know that we need to keep temperatures controlled. Uh, if, if you came to our lab, it's about 20 degrees, because we didn't want to maintain 10 degrees in terms in calibration of uh, pets and others. Okay, then carrying out mandatory trainings. Because the establishment of this lab requires mandatory trainings that would really drive you towards accreditation. These must be uh, listed down and carried out as a process of uh, of the lab moving towards accreditation. And then once this has been done pre accreditation assessment will be done. Of course, sorry, uh, we have development of procedures because we are calibrating already, we have set up everything. So develop the procedures to be used in carrying out uh, equipment maintenance, equipment uh, uh, calibration. Um, you know, if, uh, if, if we are engaging in uh, 17025, then those other procedures that are stipulated by 17025 must be developed. And that's the region, I mean, the, the city that which they are developed. Then thereafter, labs are, are encouraged to apply for um, a pre accreditation assessment to be assessed. If at all, they are ready for, for accreditation. Of course, around this time, that's when we, we shall get in, uh, in, uh, you know, involved with the issues to do with the interlaboratory compulsions, if the issues to do with the competence assessment and all these other things to ensure that the lab is actually ready for us to move towards uh, accreditation. Next slide. So, um, once that one, uh, once all these other areas were checked, 
Then, um, with that, we came to the National Equipment Calibration Center. So our center is accredited for, uh, at first it was, we, we got five parameters and then later on added on to two. So we are accredited for pipettes, for glassware, for speed, uh, speed where we, we are talking about rotational speed and centrifuge shakers and others. Then mass, where we do analytical balances and mass pieces. Then temperature, where we do uh, thermometers, conditioned chambers, hygrometers, um, um, infrared thermometers and the rest. Timers to perform time calibration, stopwatches and clocks. Humidity for uh, thermal hygrometers and humidity. And then uh, later on, pH and uh, pressure for gauges and others. Next slide. So when we did that, this picture shows you uh, how our labs are, are set up. On the, on the extreme left, we're having some guys performing calibration of centrifuges. In the middle is our volume laboratory. Uh, the volume laboratory must be should be closer to that. That that the tables should be stable to 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 avoid uh, vibration. They must be clean enough, and windows should be thoroughly closed to avoid the uh, issues of spillage of, of of dust and others. And um, you know conditions, environmental conditions, thoroughly controlled. And then on the extreme light is one other guy that is doing uh, calibration of conditioned chambers. Next slide. So we also saw that we, our center takes care of equipment sort of by safety cabinet certification. So how did we do it? Here, we, we began with the training for biomedical engineers, and these were uh, trained by Igerson University um, to certify by safety cabinets. Uh, afterwards, we added on four more engineers to have a pool of eight. And on the eight, we had four uh, accredited. We have four accredited by NSF. So we trained four and four, a pool of eight, and from there we pick four to get accreditation. Um, as we wait, we get we look for more resources to train I mean, to have all the eight engineers uh, NSF accredited. And of course, uh, this team is the one that is responsible for certification of by safety cabinets and containment rooms in the country. Um, they are also the ones responsible for carrying out uh, training uh, for you know uh, in service engineers uh, in in Uganda and there and beyond, and also the laboratory users on the first line equipment or by safety cabinets. Next slide. So that slide shows us the the reach of the tools. On the on my left is uh, the uh, shows you uh, the sets of of tools we have you, in Uganda. We have five sets of um, by safety cabinet tools, and all of them are functional. In the middle is a guy trying to do a smoke test, and on the extreme, uh, whatever is good, doing some uh, constricted uh, opening test on uh, class two B two cabinet. Next, so. That slide takes us, shows us um, our partners we work with in this in this process, and that is the regional equipment maintenance workshop. Um, no, that's our region, our 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 in-house equipment workshop that services and repair equipment before the calibration team goes and calibrates them. You know, these work together with the sixteen regional workshops that I mentioned and that are spread all over the country to offer equipment maintenance before calibration is done. We don't calibrate equipment that is not serviced. So we have to ensure that all our equipment is serviced, well maintained before we go on and calibrate. Next slide. So that slide take, uh, shows us the, the training curriculum that we developed to ensure that whatever trainings we do, we have a backup, and this backup we are supposed to be coming uh, to 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 train using documented procedures that were listed in the in the curriculum. So the curriculum was, was developed and approved by our Uganda National Curriculum Development Center as a, a, um, a, a guideline to be used for in-service training, and then we trained mentors. Um, um, 
to manage uh, laboratory equipment management. And then uh, we also talk about the equipment users uh, for proper use of uh, equipment and fast line equipment maintenance. It's an upgraded uh, curriculum and uh, anybody can actually refer to it in terms of this. And that picture shows us um, where we are uh, when we are carrying out, uh, you know, training. So those are guys being trained on the left in management of uh, cold chain equipment, and on the other, uh, on, on the right is a team being trained, uh, users being trained on proper use of biosafety cabinet. Next slide. So calibration capacity, uh, we have twelve trained engineers in man uh, management of uh, laboratory equipment in the country. We also have twelve engineers. Uh, um, in calibration of non-automated equipment, we have nine TOTs trained, and we have two certified by Kenya Teaching and Kenya Technical Trainers College uh, to offer, you know, to a, a pool to keep keep training and retraining of engineers to carry out this uh, equipment maintenance in the country. Next slide. So uh, in the calibration center capacity, we have, um, like we said, five sets of biosafety cabinet certification tools. Uh, this can enable us to carry out any issues to do with the biosafety cabinet, and all these are functional. We have five sets of refrigeration kits. As you may, you may know that we really need a lot to do with the cold chain in the management of laboratory uh, uh, proper lab, lab services. So we have five, a sets of refrigeration kits to be used for this. We also have customized kits that we use in management of uh, the, the entire range of or scope of laboratory equipment. And we have training aids because we are a training center. We have training aids where we use, which, which we use uh, to offer trainings to our you know, colleagues that have come for trainings. I also have a big space for us to be able to carry out any training up to almost 30 engineers uh, ably and uh, seated and equipped. Next slide. So our clientele in the country, we, we, we provide services to our national referral hospitals, the regional referral hospitals, um, general hospitals, center up to center threes. We also offer these services to research institutions, uh, laboratories, medical medical laboratories, veterinary uh, uh, labs, uh, national water, and others. We also offer these services to our private, not for profit, and private for profit facilities. And into here, we do some small cost recovery to make sure that we maintain our lab even after the funders have pulled out. Next slide. So that slide takes me to um, a topic called metrological traceability and interpretation of calibration results that is, has been identified as an area that uh, has been lacking in, in our laboratory, that after carrying out these trainings and offering calibration services to our laboratories, now it is evident that labs have started consuming our, our, our services, but they are lacking certain areas uh, in, in, in their way of working. So interpretation of our results and uh, certificates and how they attain their metrological traceability is uh, something that has come in to address and complete the the journey of lab equipment maintenance and this uh, uh, this slide is going to be from here it's going to be presented by my colleague rosa chom who is a quality manager for the national equipment calibration center over to you rose thank you abdul uh thank you for the for the presentation well elaborated uh and as mentioned, I'm going to be taking you through the meteorological traceability and interpretation of the results. Um, basically, this is more of a technical bit, but we, like uh, Abdul has mentioned, it is something that that is becoming uh, a little bit of a challenge for our clients. So we thought it best to to have it discussed, to have an highlight on how you can actually. Uh, do interpretation of the results. So uh, equipment calibration and meteorological traceability. 
this uh, this is picked from uh, 15189, uh, where in, uh, in the resource requirements of 6.5 that um, that states as the laboratory shall have or shall specify calibration and traceability requirements sufficient to maintain consistent reporting of the examination results. So this means that uh, as a requirement, we, we are supposed uh, as the labs, we are supposed to ensure that we maintain the traceability of the measurements. That and this traceability is picked from the equipment uh, calibrations that we do. So, as users or as equipment users, we are supposed to be able to identify who is going to provide the traceability. And as to continue on 6.5.2, it also uh, tells us how the laboratory shall be able to perform the calibration of equipment that directly or indirectly affects examination results. And this procedure shall be able to specify the conditions and use of this equipment as per the manufacturer's instruction for calibration, recording of the metrological traceability, verification of the required measurement accuracy and functioning of measuring system, at specified intervals, recording the calibration setup and date of recalibration, ensuring that where correction factors are used, these are updated and recorded when calibration, recalibration occurs. Handling of situations when calibration was out of control to minimize risk to service operations and patients. So you see that even in the standard, calibration is talked about so it's this, in a summary, how this is supposed to be catered for is that once a calibration certificate is handed over to you, you're supposed to be able to determine what correction factors or correction values have been given by the, the calibration lab, and you should ably be able to use these correction values, as we shall see in the, in the, in the next slide that we shall be seeing. Then two, you're supposed to be able to verify or to perform a verification to ensure that there is accuracy in the results uh, that you're providing, as well as in case, because sometimes we see that calibration may not be possible at that particular time, but in case it's not possible, what control is there or is available to ensure that the service uh, is still provided so will you do a, a re-verification to ascertain that the equipment is still providing the right, uh, the right measurements? Uh, so um, as, as, as the lab, we need to identify, if it is a calibration lab, we need to identify how we make the request. So in here, we look at uh, the client, how the client is going to make the request and then as a calibration lab how we shall receive this request and be able to um, to perform services as per the request so the request has to come from the user which is very very clear and well documented so um, as a calibration lab uh, you need to come up with a form or something a document that can clearly help the user to identify himself or herself, that is in terms of the address and the contact person who is going to be responsible for the contact. Then you, you it should also be able to identify the details of the equipment that is going to be calibrated because as per the standard of the 17025, you have to be able to provide uh, measurement results as per the equipment not uh, sampling, not sampling a batch or something like me. For example, you cannot have five pipettes and then you decide to do one out of the batch. No, it should be one equipment done at, at a particular interval. Then it should be able to provide for you the date of request. So when was this request made such that you can be able to track the TAT or the when you actually performed the 
the calibration. And then we also need to identify equipment that you should be able to calibrate from the center or the calibration lab and then equipment that can be calibrated from the client. So for like, for example, in Uganda, we have uh, three sets or three categories that we calibrate from uh, on-site, our, our facility, and then the other, uh, the other parameters are done from the facility or the client uh, side. Uh, but when you're, when you're coming up with this, you need to determine, for example, in terms of sensitivity of the parameter that you are supposed to be calibrating. Take an example, volume. If you're calibrating volume, it has its own uh, environmental conditions that you're supposed to meet. For example, it must be at 20 degrees with a very, very small deviation of 0 0.5. So you realize that that is a very uh, hard, a very hard environmental condition to meet at the client's facility. So if it is very hard to meet at the client's facility, then you, 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 you must have this set up at your own facility so that you can ably be able to control these, uh, these environmental conditions. You also look at, for example, the bulk of the equipment that, you, uh, that we are using and also the bulk of the equipment of the client. So take an example, a fridge may not be calibrated from uh, the calibration center, but it can be calibrated from the client's facility because it has no effect in terms of environmental conditions. So therefore, as a calibration lab, now you look at the, the, the possibility of moving to the client. Okay, so all these must be put into consideration. And if equipment is supposed to be calibrated from the calibration lab, then this form must be sent along with the equipment that is coming to the lab because you need to ascertain the equipment that has been brought versus what has been written on the documentation. Then for those that are calibrated at the client's facility, the request may be verified while you are on site. Then uh, once the equipment is received, so for, for Uganda's case, um, if the equipment is re received, uh, if the, equip the, the request has been received by the technical manager and this form very well uh, filled, the equipment is sent through the sample transport network. We have a sample transport network and uh, it is the same network that is used to deliver the items uh, while for those at the facility, the date of the visit is agreed upon. So uh, for, the, for those that are done at the client's facility, we work hand in hand with the IPs to ensure that, uh, to ensure that this work is supposed to be done. So they, they, they do the logistics and uh, they enable the team to move from the facility or from the calibration center to the client's facility. After the calibration is done, then a sticker and a certificate is generated. And this sticker or certificate is generated as per the close of 7.8 ISO 17025 2017. And just a glitch on that, on that close, uh, for example, you'll have a sticker that may not have the next due date because it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not, uh, uh, the next due date must not be must not appear on the calibration seeker unless it has been agreed by the uh, the customer. So if you have not agreed with the customer, then you must not put the next due date. And then also in the reporting or the certificate, they are well streamlined. They are well listed. What uh, identification must appear on the report? And uh, as for Uganda, uh, we have a process flow. This one is just a flow on how this equipment actually come into the calibration center where the health facility will make a request and send in the items through the sample transport network. And uh, once the sample transport driver receives these items, 
he or she will uh, deliver this equipment to the equipment calibration reception. And uh, at the reception, we verify this record after the decontamination has been done. Uh, we make we register this equipment into the system and ascertain that the equipment is fit for calibration. Just like previously, Abdul had mentioned that uh, we work together with the regional workshops to, to see that maintenance is being done well and also repair is done uh, perfectly. So before we actually perform the calibrations. So uh, we, we have to ensure that at this stage, the equipment is working and then we take it to the respective laboratories. That is for this case in our at, at our calibration center, we have the thermometry lab, we have the volume lab, and we have the time lab. And then the uh, calibration process takes place. And uh, uh, if the, the calibration is a pass, we shall put a stick on the machine and generate a certificate. And in case it is a fail, we may redo it and realize that if it is still a fail, we can then uh, put a sticker on, on the machine as failed, but if it is a pass, then we know that there should have happened, there is something that could have happened. So this is just a QC a measure to ensure that all the results are actually true. Okay, so basically after the generation of this certificate, now it goes back to the client. And once the client receives this certificate, he needs to understand uh, every detail of the calibration certificate. So on the calibration certificate, as a user, what must be uh, the first identifications or the first things that you have to look at in the certificate as a requirement first is the identification of the calibration laboratory. That is who is actually performing your calibrations. So, for example, if it is the National Equipment, the Uganda National Equipment Calibration Laboratory, the details of its identification in terms of the address, in terms of the contact, must be clearly identified. Then we also have the identification of the client, that is the laboratory that has requested for the service. And then also the identification of the equipment, that is in terms of that particular equipment that was calibrated. Like I said earlier, uh, each certificate is for a particular equipment, not sampling, not batches. So if, if there are 100 uh, pipettes, they must have, each, each pipette must have its own certificate. And then the second thing that we have to look out for is the metrological traceability. And when we talk of metrological traceability, we are looking at the equipment that was used to calibrate the client's equipment because it is the one that is uh, tracing the SI unit, okay, uh, to the national standards. So, so like, uh, for example, if, if we talk of this equipment that has been used by the client, we as the National Equipment Calibration Lab, we have to ensure that even our equipment are calibrated by the national bodies. Uh, for example, in Uganda, we have the Uganda National Bureau of Standards. In Kenya, we have the Kenya Bureau of Standards. In Tanzania, we have the Tanzanian Bureau of Standards. So those national bodies must, must be able to provide the traceability of, uh, of our documents. Then uh, the next traceability the, the next traceability is uh, personnel. And uh, here, you need to ascertain who actually performed the calibrations. Okay. Ross, my apologies for interjecting, but if you could wind up in about two minutes so that we get okay. some time for questions. Okay. Then uh, the next is the metrological, uh, sorry, the next is the calibration procedure, the procedure that was used to actually uh, uh, perform the, the calibrations. And then the result, including the units and the uncertainty that has been reported. So uh, in the results, you have to, to see the expected value. 
you have to see the expected value. For example, if it is a 20, a, a 20 microliter pipette, you have to, to see that the 20 microliter pipette was actually uh, was actually set and then you see what value was uh, being provided by your equipment. So that is the unit under test value. Then you're supposed to also uh, identify the correction value, okay? And then you also identify the uncertainty value because all these values are used during the verification of the equipment after, after calibration. That is just a sample of the certificate and all those that I've talked about are uh, uh, all stipulated in that uh, in this certificate. So uh, to make use of these values, once you 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 once you identify a correction value, this value must be stuck onto the machine for the ease identification, and then the uncertainty value is used to calculate the acceptable working range of the equipment on return into service. Yeah, thank you so much. That is what I wanted to share. Fascinating, fascinating and very excellent presentation from the two colleagues and of course the introductory remarks from Dr. Susan, who heads the department that actually is uh, leading this venture. Uh, we have very quick questions. I am not going to go into the summaries here because we have quite a number of questions and keep them coming for those that we cannot answer during this session. We'll get them to the presenters and they'll deal with those and we'll put them as part of the package that will be shared with every attendee. Let me start with you, uh, uh, Abdul, Engineer Abdul. And uh, the key thing is that you've made really a lot of progress in Uganda. That's a comment from many uh, attendees here. First question is, how much support were you getting uh, from outside the ministry mainstream support? And then uh, the, the, the second question, I want you to deal with the two together. Are you guys open to supporting other countries should they desire to set up their own equipment maintenance and calibration center? Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Francis, and thank you so much, uh, uh, attendees, for the beautiful and encouraging uh, comments. This gives us a lot of strength. So to answer the first uh, question, how much uh, have we gotten from um, uh, outside uh, the MOH? I would say how much have we gotten from uh, um uh, the government, of course, government of Uganda has contributed a lot into this uh, because of the stable environment that it has created that attracts so much in terms of revenue and uh, and uh, development partners to come and partner with Uganda. That can't be taken for granted. And the other one, of course, is uh, the good that good leadership has also resulted into uh, a goodwill from um, uh, funders like PEPFA. PEPFA has really given us a lot of support through different partners, uh, you know, through uh, CDC and, and others. It, it has really worked uh you know immensely in ensuring that this calibration lab works up to now and uh, of course global fund has also given us a lot of support and uh, these are all uh, um you know accredited or uh, uh, you know related to government support and and goodwill that government of uganda is actually having in this line uh, so how much is uh, Uganda giving? It's a lot because much as it's uh, partner driven, but it's because of the good uh, leadership uh, of the country that we're having it has resulted into this. Then the other thing is, of course, we are very much open to uh, to offering this support uh, to countries. As uh, we talk now, we are discussing a program for uh, providing technical support to uh, extra countries in the region. And we shall be having this training starting problem um, maybe next month, late next month, uh, where we have uh, we shall be providing these uh, services to countries for free. We don't charge anything. We really want to have uh, capacity built across Africa to ensure that we uh, you know manage and and our affairs as African countries, so we can ably give uh, this technical uh, service uh, advice to any country that is willing. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdu. And uh, just, just to take it on from there, the next question is actually going to be, you're open to the trainings that you do for the, the other countries. Do you enroll individuals in the program for your training or you actually enroll groups that are coming from the national ministries of health so that then wait, when they get back, they, they, they're working towards setting up their equipment maintenance and calibration centers? Yes, thank you so much, Francis. Indeed, yes, you, you've you've mentioned it. We really would want to would love to work with Minister of Health uh, of the respective countries to be able to build sustainable, um, you know, systems in their respective countries. You know, so we we really uh, encouraging work or working with countries other than individuals to have uh, this system, uh, you know, built uh, across Africa. And uh, we, we are working uh, together with teaching uh, institutions, um, of course, credit to Chambogo University that has really worked tirelessly to ensure that uh, together we establish this center and offer these trainings that are traceable uh, to, to, to the university. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and my last question to you before I get to Dr. Susan is on the maintenance of diagnostic equipment. I know that we have the, the supportive equipment and the diagnostic equipment. And also the vendors and manufacturers sometimes tend to be very protective with their, 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 their equipment and not opening up their technologies to everyone else. And so they tend to use their own engineers. What is your experience in Uganda dealing with uh, maintenance and servicing of some diagnostic equipment that uh, the, the manufacturers may not be very open to letting every other engineer get to know all the details? Thank you so much, Francis. That That is a big challenge and it's working, I think, across Africa. Uh, manufacturers, especially of automated equipment, uh, would wish to have their equipment closed onto their, themselves and their own engineers. So that is actually what was happening in Uganda as well. So what we did as a country uh, through the, 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 the policy and procedures that we developed, um, we then said, let us as a country handle equipment that we procure outrightly. So all auxiliary equipment in the lab is managed by us. And uh, everything that is uh, not us, then service providers come. But we still, as a ministry, follow them up uh, to ensure that they are providing the services that we are to the, our facilities are meant to receive. Over, thanks. Thank you. Um do now, Susan, just a quick one on your side, having led this initiative that has really brought something fascinating to the country. If you have colleagues from other countries leading the directorates of lab services and they desire to set up this, if they do not have capacity to train biomedical engineers in country, would you guide them and encourage them still to go ahead and set up this? and outsource engineers. Sorry, it looks like Dr. Susan, uh, can I hear you? Uh, if not, then Abdul, would you take up that question? Um, I'm, I'm thinking probably maybe Dr. Susan might have, uh, you know, she, we are doing a lot of multitasking around this time. Probably she, has, she might have been uh, uh, or, or whatever by, by another call. So, um, so, Yes, it's something that I would definitely encourage countries to venture into. It's something that is paying. Uh, we didn't talk about uh, how much the country is saving in terms of uh, 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 these services being managed in the country. Uh, in Uganda, uh, annually, we save almost uh, to a tune of about $1 million annually by these services being maintained by us. You know, so uh, it's something that is that is workable, 
and something that is attainable. And countries are encouraged. Currently, we've actually had uh, uh, different MOU with different countries uh, where, they, we, where they are sending engineers in Uganda uh, to be trained in our universities, but attached to, to our organization to have to ensure that they do proper equipment maintenance program that is inclusive of all these. So it's something that we that is open. And the African countries are encouraged to, to, to work with us uh, to make sure that we offer uh, these services across Africa uh, in the same way. Uh, mind you, we are an accredited laboratory, so the standards that, was, uh, that we are following are the standards that we would want our, our colleagues in the rest of the countries to offer. So it's attainable and done and, and doable, uh, and we are free and open to any country uh, uh, requesting for services. Over. And speaking to accreditation, uh, there is a question that is asking your time to accreditation. How long did it take you uh, from starting your preparation to when you got accredited? Um, no, not sure. it, we, it took us about three years uh, to start working and attaining accreditation. It took us three years. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Abdul and team. Really very fascinating. And colleagues, questions that are coming through. Those that we feel were not answered, we will deal with them. And of course, do not forget that the, the portfolio that is taken by equipment is a huge portfolio. And all you need to do is to make sure that that huge investment is put into good use by acquiring the right equipment, maintaining and calibrating them so that then you're able to utilize them and get the quality of data out of those devices equipment, apparatuses, and whatever else you would call them. We're getting to almost the end, and let me just hand it over to Ross, Sean, and Ross, if you could just give us your closing remarks. Very technical. Thank you, Francis. Uh, thank you, members. Uh, thank you, attendees, uh, for taking your time off to come and uh, attend this, uh, this session. And uh, I would also want to take this opportunity to thank the organizers, the SLM, uh, for this opportunity given to us. And I pray that this will not stop and we can continue giving the, uh, the knowledge to share the knowledge that we do have, and as well as encourage uh, the other people on board to ensure that uh, uh, we see Africa try to beat the burden of equipment maintenance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ross. And Abdul Mutsaka. Uh, Francis, uh, is, uh, has it frozen on my side? Um, yes, I can't I hear you, but. Um, uh, thank you so much, Francis, for uh, um, providing us this opportunity. We can't take it for granted. Uh, I mean, so many people wouldn't have whatever uh, chosen us, but we're proud of you, SLM. Uh, and thank you so much for uh, choosing us. For the attendees, uh, thank you so much for sparing time and uh, attending to our presentation. We're open and we can be reached. Uh, Francis can share with you all our contacts and you're very much welcome. Uh, uh, just in, in case you have any, any query that you want or any question about equipment management as a cycle, we are willing and able, able to, uh, to provide any type of assistance. Thank you so much. Uh, over to Francis. Okay, so colleagues, we've reached to the end of our session today and thank you very much again for joining. It has been exciting a session and we'll definitely uh, get to you with the session slides and the recording. Again, do not forget that we have yet another very exciting session next Thursday. The flyers will be getting out anytime now, and, and, and we hope to see you there. So from us, ASLM and team, we wish you the very best of your morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you and bye. bye for now.